In class so far, we have done many problems covering the rotation of a moving object around a singular axis, typically the z-axis. Whatever axis a body is rotating about, we can often choose to call it the z-axis to help make the problem easier to understand. But this doesn't tell the whole story according to chapter 10. We will find that for a given body rotating about any given point that there are three mutually perpendicular principal axes. Today, I'm going to introduce tennis racket theorem, also called intermediate axis theorem and the Jana Beckoff effect that uses many concepts from chapter 10, such as principal axes of inertia, Euler's equations, and angular momentum. To demonstrate this theory effectively, we can use any object that has three different moments of inertia for each principal axis. And a tennis racket is the perfect example. See here, there is one axis along the long side one axis going through the tennis racket itself, and one axis going through the side of the racket. Each of these axes of rotation have different moments of inertia, which changes proportional to the mass and size of the object's radius. Now, what happens when the tennis racket gets tossed up in the air, rotating at each of its principal axes? Tossing the tennis racket in the air along the first principal axis of rotation looks like this. As we can see, the tennis racket stays stable in its rotation and follows the correct path. When we toss the tennis racket in the air along the third principal axis, it looks like this. Just like before, we can see that the racket was stable and stayed in its rotational path. When we toss the racket in the air along its second principal axis, also known as the intermediate axis of rotation, it looks like this. Something about the rotation doesn't look quite right. When we look at a bird's eye view of it, we see that the racket actually flips 180 degrees while it's in the air. Okay, now that we've shown what tennis racket theorem looks like, there are a lot of things we need to understand. We can start by talking a little bit about the historical background of the theorem. Tennis racket theorem was a result of classical mechanics originally discovered by Vladimir Janabekov a Russian astronaut who discovered the theorem while in space in 1985. During his trip, Jana Bekov and Viktor Savink were sent to save a spacecraft that had shut down and was being um, beginning to drift out of orbit. Supplies that they had brought from Earth were locked down with wingnuts, which also have three unique axes of rotation. When Jana Bekov unscrewed the wingnut, he noticed the interesting behavior of the intermediate axis becoming unstable and then flipping 180 degrees. After discovering the theorem, Jan and Bekov kept it secret for years, and then later, a team of mathematicians independently discovered the behavior with a tennis racket and published the twisting tennis racket years later. Because of this complex background, the intermediate axis theorem goes by both the Jan and Bekov effect and tennis racket theorem. Tennis racket theorem states that for an object with three different moments of inertia, rotation about the axis of intermediate moment of inertia is unstable, while rotation about the other two axes is stable. Now, tennis racket theorem is difficult to explain intuitively, which is why we need to turn to the math behind it. Let's start with what principal axes are in the first place. Principal axes are each of three mutually perpendicular axes in a body about which the moment moment of inertia is at a maximum. In chapter 10, the existence of principal axes is mentioned and states, for a rigid body at any point O, where O is the origin, there are three perpendicular principal axes through O, meaning that there are three perpendicular axes through O with respect to which the inertia tensor I is di diagonal, and hence with the property that the angular velocity omega points along any one of these axes, the same is true of the angular momentum L. There's a lot of information in this statement. First, an inertia tensor is a 3x3 three three matrix of the moments of inertia. We use our inertia tensor to solve for instantaneous angular momentum, which helps us solve for angular momentum separated into our different components. According to the text, though, since we found the principal axes of the body with the corresponding principal moments, there is no need to evaluate the inertia tensor with respect to the other axes. We then know that with respect to the principal axes, our inertia tensor is going to be diagonalized. And using our di diagonalized matrix, we can then derive Euler equations that help us prove tennis racket theorem. We'll use our Euler equations to determine the evolution of angular velocity as seen in the frame fixed in the rigid body. We will then 
be using these equations to determine whether our rotations about each axis is stable or unstable. Because much of our discussion about rotations is easier when referring to these principal axes, we will choose to use the principal axes as our coordinate system in this case. Let's consider our x-axis to have a moment of inertia of I1, the y-axis to have a moment of inertia of I2, and the z-axis to have a moment of inertia of I3. Because each of these axes have a different moment of inertia, we can assume that they have three unique values for angular velocity too. Rotating around the x-axis will have the smallest amount of inertia because only the light masses are in motion. Rotating around the z-axis will have the greatest moment of inertia because only the heavy masses are in motion. Rotating around the y-axis will have an intermediate moment of inertia. The angular velocity moves away from the axis exponentially and the motion becomes really complicated. Suppose that we consider the motion in which angular momentum of the body frame is nearly along principal axis 3, so that in our body frame, omega 1 and omega 2 are much smaller than omega 3. Our Euler equations will look like this. Given our initial conditions, we can ignore the time dependence of omega 3 because its time derivative is proportional to the product of the two small values, omega 1 and 2. We are able to assume this because a tennis racket has three principal moments that are very different from each other. If we want to treat omega-3 as a constant, the other two Euler equations are linear in the small quantities, omega-1 and 2, and we can write them as they're written in equation set 2. Now, if we differentiate this first equation and then substitute the second equation into our new one, we get equation 3. Now here's the important part. If I3 is the largest or smallest moment of inertia, then we know that our resulting equation is going to be less than zero and our tennis racket is going to remain stable in its rotation. But equation three describes an oscillation. Omega one and two both oscillate about zero and remain small. In this case, the motion of the system basically remains about axis three with small oscillating wobbles. But if I3 were to be the intermediate moment of inertia instead, then we would get the result below, where it is greater than zero. In this case, equation three describes an unstable equilibrium. The reason our result is stable if the equation is less than zero and unstable if our result is greater than zero is because omega one and omega two begin to grow exponentially, which creates that flip during the rotation of the intermediate axis. The motion around ax the axis in with the intermediate moment of inertia is very complicated, and finding these equilibrium values help explain mathematically the behavior behind tennis racket theorem. Just so you know, it doesn't apply to just tennis rackets either. You can try it out with pretty much any object that has three principal axes of rotation, like a phone or a book. Definitely takes a little bit of practice, though. Thank you.